The next big topic that we're going to focus on will be glucose metabolism. And in this lecture, I'd like to basically introduce what this concept actually is, what it involves, and what it attempts to actually achieve. So let's begin by describing, generally speaking, what glucose metabolism is. So glucose metabolism is the process by which our body, our cells, basically try to transform the energy that is stored in the chemical bonds of the sugar molecule, the glucose, into the energy that is stored in the bonds of ATP molecules because ultimately it's not the glucose molecules but the ATP molecules that are used by the cells to carry out many different types of processes, for instance, creating electrochemical gradients by using membrane pumps or using ATP to basically contract muscle. So contraction of muscle, it can be skeleton muscle or cardiac muscle or smooth muscle uses ATP molecules. Now, what types of processes actually make up glucose metabolism? So the first process that we're going to look at will be glycolysis. And glycolysis is the process by which the glucose molecules present in a cytoplasm are broken down into pyruvate molecules. So two pyruvate molecules a net result of two ATP molecules, which can be used by the cell to carry out some type of process, as well as NADH molecules, and we'll discuss what those are in a future lecture. But ultimately, glycolysis produces these byproduct molecules we call pyruvates. Now, glycolysis is an anaerobic process, and what that means is it does not require oxygen to actually take place. So whether or not we have oxygen doesn't actually matter because glycolysis doesn't actually use oxygen. Now, in the absence of oxygen, under anaerobic conditions, when we don't have plenty of oxygen present inside the cell, these pyruvate molecules will undergo a process known as fermentation. Now, some cells in nature undergo alcohol fermentation, and that produces ethanol from the pyruvate. Other organisms, for instance, cells of our body, undergo lactic acid fermentation, and that transforms the pyruvate into lactic acid, or the conjugate base of lactic acid is lactate. So inside our body, when the cells of our body don't have enough oxygen, they will take the pyruvates and transform them into lactic acid molecules. Now, what happens if there is oxygen present in, 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 the cell of our, in, in the cells of our body? Well, in the case of aerobic conditions, when we have oxygen present in the cell, the pyruvate molecules will move into the mitochondria of the cell. And so this is our mitochondria. And inside the mitochondria, we have processes such as pyruvate decarboxylation, as well as the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain found on the inner membrane of that mitochondria actually uses those oxygen molecules to ultimately transform the pyruvates into carbon dioxide molecules, as well as ATP molecules. In fact, the majority of ATP molecules produced by our cells are formed via the process that takes place inside the mitochondria. Now, this is known as aerobic cellular respiration. And aerobic cellular respiration includes not only the processes that take place in the mitochondria, but also actually includes glycolysis itself. But glycolysis is itself an anaerobic process. This takes place regardless of whether or not we actually have O2 molecules present in our cell. Now, let's suppose the cell has plenty of ATP molecules to actually go around, and so it doesn't actually want to produce any more ATP molecules. What happens in this Pro what happens in this situation. So in this situation, because we don't actually want to break down the glucose molecules, we want to store the glucose molecules in a form that basically will not be broken down. And so we take the individual glucose molecules and we transform them into their polysaccharide form we call glycogen. Now, what about these pyruvate molecules and these lactate molecules? What happens to them in the case that we have many, many ATP inside our body? So, in this case, these pyruvate molecules or lactic acid molecules are transformed back into glucose 
and then the glucose is stored in a form we call glycogen and the process by which we transform these pyruvates and lactic acid molecules back into glucose is known as gluconeogenesis. So gluco means glucose, neo means new molecules, and genesis means the formation. So the formation of these new glucose molecules by using the pyruvate or the lactic acid molecules. Now, we see that glycolysis breaks down the glucose, but gluconeogenesis uses these byproducts to reform that glucose molecule. So one goes this way and the other one goes in reverse. So if the cell needs to break down glucose and produce ATP molecules, then what it does is basically shuts off gluconeogenesis. But if the cell has plentiful amounts of ATP molecules and it doesn't actually want to break down the glucose, then gluconeogenesis is more likely to actually take place. In fact, we see that glycolysis and, glu and, and gluconeogenesis do not actually take place at the same exact moment in time. So when one process is activated, the other process is usually inhibited and vice versa. So, now we know the general idea of what glucose metabolism actually is, but how does that glucose actually make its way into the cells of our body? Or more generally, how does the glucose actually make its way into our body in the first place? Well, via the ingestion of food. So if we, re if we eat a meal that is rich in carbohydrates, that's how the glucose actually makes its way into our body. So there are two types of sugar molecules, carbohydrates, that we typically ingest. So carbohydrates, polysaccharides, that come from plants, and carbohydrates, polysaccharides, that come from animals. Now, for instance, if we eat a piece of chicken, that chicken not only has protein and fat, it also contain, contains polysaccharides, carbohydrates, stored in a form we call glycogen, which is the same form that we mentioned just a moment ago. Now, if we ingest things like pasta or bread or cereal, these are actually polysaccharides that come from plants. And so what we're ingesting is starch. And there are two types of starch. So we have amylose and amylopectin. So one of them is basically a linear helical structure. That's the amylose. And the amylopectin is, like the glycogen, actually a branched form of starch. Now, we see that these polysaccharides are inherently too large to actually fit into our cells and they're too large to actually move around and transport in the blood plasma. And so, before these large polysaccharides actually make their way into the blood plasma of our body and into our cells, these carbohydrates must be broken down into smaller components. In fact, they must be broken down into these individual glucose molecules before the cells can actually uptake those glucose molecules and store the glucose as glycogen or break down the glucose to form ATP molecules. So the question is, what are these enzymes, digestive enzymes, proteases, that basically break down these carbohydrates into their individual monomeric form? Well, we have many different types of enzymes, and I've listed six enzymes, actually seven enzymes on the board. And let's begin with sal a salivary alpha amylase. So salivary simply means it exists in a saliva. So when we eat food and when we're chewing the food, that saliva actually contains a specific type of digestive enzyme, a protease known as alpha amylase. And what the alpha amylase does is it begins to cleave alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkages that exist in the starch as well as glycogen. So, this begins the cleavage of alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkages in the mouth, and this breaks it down into smaller polysaccharides and oligosaccharides. 
Now, from the mouth, it moves via the esophagus, eventually makes its way into our stomach. Now, in the stomach, nothing actually breaks down. So what that means is the actual glycosidic linkages, the bonds, don't break down in the stomach. But once it makes its way into the small intestine, that's when the rest of that uh, digestion actually takes place because the pancreas produces a specific type of carbohydrate digestive enzyme known as pancreatic alpha amylase. And this is much more potent and much more powerful than the salivary alpha amylase. So, the pancreatic alpha amylase also is able to break down those same alpha 1,4 glycosidic linkages, but this actually breaks down the polysaccharide into either disaccharides or trisaccharides. So in the case of starch or glycogen, we basically break down these individual polysaccharides into maltose molecules, which are disaccharides that consist of two glucose, or trisaccharides that consist of three glucose glucose known as maltotriose. Now, the actual cells on the epithelium of the small intestine actually contain these secretory vesicles, these granules that themselves contain enzymes. And so these are the enzymes that they basically have. So we have maltase, we have alpha glucosidase, we have alpha dextrinase, we have sucrase and lactase. And all of these enzymes are basically specific to the type of molecules and type of bonds they actually cleave. So for instance, in the case of maltase, maltase is released by the cells on the brush border and this enzyme basically breaks down the maltose. So here we said the pancreatic alpha amylase breaks down the oligosaccharides and polysaccharides that could not be broken down by the sal salivary alpha amylase into maltose or maltotriase. And these maltose molecules are broken down by these maltase enzymes at the brush border of our epithelium of the small intestine. And once, they, uh, and once the maltose is broken down into the glucose constituents, then the glucose can actually be taken by the cell by using a special type of glucose transporter, as we'll discuss in a future lecture. Now, we also mentioned the maltotriose. And we have another type of enzyme, a different enzyme known as alpha glucosidase that basically breaks down the maltotriose into the three constituent glucose molecules. And only then can the glucose molecules can actually make their way into the cell of our body. Then we also have act, uh, then we also have alpha dextrinose or dextrinase. Now, in the case of alpha dextrinase, so let's go back to starch and glycogen. So if we discuss, so if we ingest the amylopectin version of starch or glycogen, we know that these two types of polysaccharides not only have the alpha 1,4 glycosidic bonds, they also have the alpha 1,6 glycosidic bonds. And the alpha amylase found in our mouth and the alpha amylase found in our small intestine that is produced by the pancreas, these cannot break down those alpha 1,6 linkages. And that's where this alpha dextrinase actually comes into play. So the alpha dextrinase basically breaks down the limit dextrin, which is basically those oligosaccharides that contain the alpha 1,6 bonds, which were not broken down by either of these two types of enzymes. And so it's this one that breaks down these dextrin molecules, breaks down those alpha 1,6 linkages, breaks the molecules into their individual constituent glucose molecules, and then the, and then the glucose is ingested into our cell. Now, glucose molecules are not the only sugar molecules that we actually ingest into our body. We can also ingest, for instance, galactase, we can ingest, an, uh, or a, a galactose, we can ingest fructose, and so forth. And so we have many other examples of enzymes that are used to break down these specific types of glycosidic bonds. So we have sucrase, which basically breaks down the glycosidic bond between fructose and sugar and um, fructose and uh, glucose. So when fructose and glucose 
uh, combine, they form sucrose and sucrase breaks down sucrose. So sucrose is essentially a mobile form of a carbohydrate sugar molecule found inside plants. So when we eat plants, we can also actually eat these sucrose molecules. And so sucrase is responsible for breaking down sucrose. Now, we also have lactase. So, uh, lactase is essentially a digestive enzyme that breaks down lactose. And lactose is a disaccharide that consists of glucose and galactose. And lactose we obtain from dairy products, from milk. So, if we drink milk, inside milk we we'll find these lactose disaccharides. And it's the lactase that breaks down these disaccharides into their individual monomers. So, once all these different types of enzymes and many more basically break down all the different types of carbohydrates inside the small intestine, only then can these actually make their way into the cytoplasm of our cells and into the blood via this process of transport by using these special types of membrane transport protein molecules.